Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for the Sunday, April 25th, 2021. I am Relay Reader Zach Cosner. I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found in the link below this video in the description on Facebook and on YouTube. You can also head to our website, www.centralprespb.com. Head for the publications link. If you scroll down and find today's date, you can click on that date and you'll download the PDF for the bulletin for today's service. Uh, that can be either printed out or viewed on a mobile device or tablet. Once you uh, have acquired the uh, bulletin for today's service, I ask that you uh, turn your attention to the announcements found on the last page of the bulletin. The session of CPC is happy to announce we'll be returning to in-person worship starting next week. Things will look a little different starting out. We'll be requiring mass usage, mask usage in the church and asking for everyone to socially distance in the sanctuary. We're excited for, uh, to see everyone and we hope everyone can join us. Uh, for those who will not be able to join us, we're going to be trying to stream the service live on Facebook. Uh, there are some technical issues we need to iron out before May 2nd, so please be patient with us while we get this working. Archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and YouTube. Links to each can be found on our website, centralprespb.com. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. In life, in death, in life beyond death, Jesus Christ is Lord over powers and principalities, over all who determine, control, govern, or finance the affairs of humankind, Jesus Christ is Lord. Of the poor, of the broken, of the sinned against and the sinner, Jesus Christ is Lord. Above the church, beyond our most excellent theologies, and in the quiet corners of our hearts, Jesus Christ is Lord. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us ask God to forgive us, first in unison, using the prayer that is printed in the bulletin, and then silently. Good shepherd, you call to us. We confess that we know your voice, but fail to heed it. Merciful God, we know that in order to walk paths of righteousness and enjoy your abundant life, we must follow you in trust and obedience. We confess that though you beckon us, we go our own way. And though you defend us, we are filled with fear. You spread a table before us, our cup overflows. Yet we judge those with whom we are seated and worry there will not be enough of your mercy to go around. In your mercy, forgive us, Lord. Take us by the hand and guide us in your ways. Help us to rest in your presence and there learn to be grateful and generous. And now silently. Amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow, encouraged to, uh, encouraged to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Uh, unfortunately, Rose von Tunglin was not able to join us for our children's sermon this week, so I now turn the floor over to Reverend Tim Reeves. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first scripture reading this morning is the 23rd Psalm. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life 
and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And our next reading comes from the third chapter of the first epistle of John, beginning with verse 16 and proceeding through verse 24. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. And finally, from the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to John, beginning with verse 11 and proceeding through verse 18. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So begins what is probably the most beloved scripture in the entire Bible. We hear those words and the cherished images of God leading us beyond the storms of life in order that we may find rest in green pastures beside still waters comes to mind. The quiet assurance and the gracious comfort offered to us, even in the valley of the shadow of death, has been a priceless treasure of peace which surpasses all understanding. Anytime we have experienced death of a loved one or been forced to come to terms with our own mortality, 
I'm sure we can all give countless examples of how God's goodness and mercy have followed us throughout our lives, and many a person throughout the years has borne witness to the comforting protection we have received from God's rod and staff. So reading the 23rd Psalm is like being visited by an old and cherished friend. I think it's therefore only natural that we should feel a certain sense of nostalgia whenever we read these words. Part of this psalm's beauty is that its confession is based on the salvation history of God's chosen people. Hearing the words of this psalm, the people of Israel would have been reminded of the countless ways that God had shepherded them in their past. And for instance, or, or, or for instance, during their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness where God had provided everything they needed. They would have offered up prayers that God would restore one's life or one's soul and would have had concrete examples in their collective history of how God had answered those prayers. Repeatedly, God had led the people in paths of righteousness. So for David and for all of Israel, these words were a song of heartfelt gratitude from those long familiar with God's providential care and loving kindness. But to speak of our Lord as our shepherd is not just to, she to celebrate God's caring and nurturing attentiveness. Because the word shepherd was also used in ancient Israel to refer to her kings. So to affirm that our Lord is our shepherd is to state in no uncertain terms that we belong to God, that God is sovereign over every aspect of our lives, and that is a bold statement to make because it confirm or affirms the notion that where the Lord leads us, we will follow. And what the Lord commands of us, we will do. To profess that Jesus is Lord is to profess that he is Lord of all. Not just those whom we might deem acceptable. Moreover, God is not concerned with how comfortable we may be over whom God chooses to include or exclude from the church. Rather, we, as God's sheep, must simply go where our shepherd leads. And where our shepherd leads us is often far beyond our comfort zones. With that in mind, I was really taken this week with the words, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I found myself wondering what the role of the enemies in this scene was. Were the enemies standing off apart from the table with their tongues hanging out in envious hunger? That's likely how many of us want to treat our enemies and want God to treat our enemies as well, right? We want God to hate the very people we love to hate and to destroy those who seek to destroy us. There's something deep down in our sinful being which feels right about having our enemies forced to watch us enjoying the good life while they themselves are excluded. But the grammar of the Hebrew in that verse offers a rather challenging alternative, especially when we consider the nature 
of God as God is revealed in all of Scripture. And this alternative suggests that our enemies are now welcome at the very same table we have been invited to and at God's own invitation. So I ask this morning, what does it mean to say that God includes the very people we love to hate at the table where we find ourselves? Is it really possible that God can be that forgiving? Is it thinkable that God would be that unfair? Does God truly expect us to sit at the table with those whom our hearts hold in highest contempt? Those provocative questions strike at the very core of our understanding of God. And by answering them, we just may learn more than we ever knew about our good shepherd and the nature of our shepherd's grace. Remember, as I said, that to acknowledge that the Lord is our shepherd is to acknowledge that God is sovereign of our lives. And as the Lord and giver of life, it belongs to God and God alone to be gracious to whomever God chooses. Only God, as the sovereign ruler of heaven and earth, has the authority to exercise mercy or vengeance. And as the one who prepares the table to begin with, it belongs solely to God to make up the guest list. But if we are honest, when looking around at our enemies, we likely think to ourselves that it is as if the shepherd, rather than keeping the wolves at bay, has suddenly decided to invite them right into the middle of the pasture. But here's the catch. In our zeal to want to exclude others, we tend to act as if we ourselves are somehow entitled to be here in the Lord's presence and to eat from the Lord's bounty, which the Lord provides. But we know that that view is distorted and that it fails to take into account the fact that we all stand in need of God's grace. Moreover, if God chooses to be gracious to us, we hardly have any reason to protest if God chooses to be gracious to our enemies as well. As Jesus told his disciples, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. And there might be some who would, would, who would argue that even though we can readily admit that we all stand in need of grace, the sins that we commit are nowhere near the level of sin that others have surely perpetrated. But in God's economy, there is no hierarchy of sin. All sin, regardless of the form it takes, is equally detestable in the eyes of God. And lest we protest that this is unfair, we must remember that fairness does not enter into God's economy either. Rather, what God is focused on is justice. Well, what's the difference? Take, for instance, the repeated example throughout Scripture where God shows a preferential option for those on the fringes of society. The poor, the widow, the orphan, the littlest, the last, the lost, the least, the left out. And perhaps the crown jewel of God's justice towards the poor 
was the year of Jubilee, occurring every 50 years. The year of Jubilee was a time when all debts were forgiven, so that if the impoverished had been forced to sell themselves into slavery to pay their debts, then in the year of Jubilee, they were set free. And if one was forced to sell one's land in order to pay a debt, the purchaser of that land was forced to return it to its original owner, or if that person was dead, to his family in the year of Jubilee. It's a radical notion. And it's a concept which sounds very foreign and unfair in our capitalist society. Those who legally acquire someone else's property would not find it fair if they had to turn around and give it back to the original owner 25 years, 10 years, 40 years, or even one year after the date of purchase because of the year of Jubilee. There's nothing fair about that. But God is not a God of fairness. God is a God of justice. And if ever you should doubt that truth, you need only consider the cross of Jesus Christ. Because there was nothing remotely fair about that. Jesus Christ, the only man ever to walk the earth, tempted as we are in every way, yet without sin, endured pain, horror, and the shame of crucifixion. The good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. He laid down his life for Judas, who sold him out. For Peter, who denied him. He laid down his life for every single disciple who turned tail and scattered on the night that he was arrested. He laid down his life for those who mocked him, cursed him, flogged him, beat him, and crucified him, crying out from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And he laid down his life for each and every one of us, in spite of all the ways that today we continue to betray him, deny him, and even embarrass him. The implications of all this are clear, because just as we are welcomed by God, so too are we to be a welcoming community, which which embraces everyone to whom God sends the invitation, which is everyone created in his image. Our epistle put it this way. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. In other words, how we live our lives in this moment, at this time, in this place, reveals to the world in no uncertain terms whether We just know the words of the psalm that says, the Lord is my shepherd. Or whether we really and truly know the shepherd. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask that you would stand with me as, or or join with me as we affirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which can be found printed in your bulletins. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our tithes and offerings this week will be taken electronically. We invite you to head to our website at www.centralpresspb.com and look for the Donate Now link at the top of the web page. We accept debit and credit cards, and you can also re set up recurring donations there. If you do not feel comfortable tithing online, we do accept checks and money orders mailed to 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. Let us pray. <clears throat> It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gifts of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life in your midst. And your Holy Spirit continues to confront us convict us, correct us, call us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, in our great gratitude, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, indeed our very selves, for you to use as you see fit until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. As we turn to our time of sharing joys and concerns, I uh, would ask that you pray for Emil Brown, who was hospitalized this week. Uh, he's been released and is resting at home, uh, but is experiencing some intestinal issues. Uh, we pray or, or ask that you pray for Sydney Hayes, who dropped a barbell on her foot. And Cindy May, a friend of Pat Druitt, has blood clots in both lungs and one behind her knee. Uh, Jim Monk, the brother of Pat Druitt, has had heart issues and still is at UAMS. Uh, Brad Von Tunglen is home uh, resting. He's really weak and is having some issues with his new medication and would covet our prayers as well. Shelly Salinas, a friend of Susie Von Tunglen, was diagnosed this week with cancer. The brother of Dana Neal, Corey Neal, had so shoulder successful on, sat on Friday. Uh, it was successful. We thank God for that. And we continue to ask for your prayers for Dominic Munn as uh, he recovers from his surgery to lengthen his leg and pray that uh, uh, he will continue to receive good news on that front. With those joys and concerns, let us now turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that you are always more willing to give than we are to ask. And that even before we ask, you know our needs before they are even on our tongue. And so we come to you confident of your love for us, assured of your nurture, comforted by the peace which can only come from knowing you as our shepherd. And in trusting into your ever-loving care, Emil Brown, Sidney Hayes, Cindy May, Jim Monk, Brad Von Tunglen, 
Shelly Salinas, Corey Neal, and Dominic Munn. We remember, too, the women and men who are still fighting against the pandemic on the front lines, our health care and medical workers, those who are administering vaccines, those who are still struggling with the uncertainty and ravages of a diagnosis of COVID. Those who have been separated from loved ones in hospitals or even by death because of this pandemic. May they find in you a source of comfort and hope, strength and renewal. We lift up to, O oh God, those who are known only to you. Heal them in body, mind, or circumstance, working in them wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing always in the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit, remembering not just the words, but showing in truth and action that we know the Lord is our shepherd. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.